So, hi, my name's Richard. You might have seen me on the television, not the actual television, but the television's across uh, site. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, I'm one of the placement interns here on a 12-month uh, fixed contract uh, while studying a degree in business and marketing. Um, and this presentation I titled kind of Living with Autism. Um, yeah, given my name, there's my spiel, there's my website and all that jazz. Um, so I want to start off asking you all a question about what's called the hidden disability. Now, autism, uh, Asperger syndrome, which is a form of autism I am diagnosed with, uh, and other conditions such as ADHD, uh, dementia, bipolar disorder, they all sit under the banner of the hidden disability. Now, I want you all to have a bit of a thought exercise here, and I want you to tell me which person out of this family unit is disabled. Anyone want to have a guess? And they all are, or they're all not. The question is, is because as a society, that's the disabled sign you see in uh, toilets and parking spaces and so on. And the affiliation is that a disability must be visible. So if I was in a wheelchair or had crutches, I would be seen to be disabled. Whereas those with the conditions I just mentioned, <coughs> you can't see it, therefore it maybe doesn't exist, um, if that makes sense. So um, it's a bit like the old um, idea of, uh, you know, see to be believed. We can't see atoms, yet we know they exist. Um, bit of an odd comparison, but hope you get where I'm coming from. So I want to go over something called the autistic spectrum because I just mentioned a condition I have called Asperger syndrome and there's autism and what the heck does it all mean? So the autism spectrum is a range of conditions. Uh, as I say, Asperger syndrome is what's called high functioning autism. And what that means is that people diagnosed with Asperger's tend to be able to function fairly ordinarily within society, whereas people with autism may be lower functioning and may uh, be unable to contribute as much as they would like into society. Now be careful I use the word may there, and that's because each person diagnosed with autism is affected differently, which is why it's such an interesting conundrum when somebody reads a textbook, say, on autism, and they suddenly think, right, I know everything about every single autistic person in the world, because you'll get some people with autism who struggle to speak at all, and then you'll get Muppets like me who won't shut up. So <laughs> I've already covered that. Now, one thing that is important to note is that the term autism spectrum condition, or just autism, has um, become prevalent in the United States in that terms such as Asperger syndrome have been removed from diagnostic criteria. Um, so the reason I mention this is because whatever happens in the US as far as these diagnostic materials go eventually travel over to Europe. So for the time being, you'll, you'll still hear about Asperger's being diagnosed and what have you, but eventually it will probably just tidy away. It doesn't mean we still don't exist. It just means that we've got a different name. So how does it affect people? Now, this piece I'm going to mention here, I must say, take, I wouldn't say with a grain of salt, but it's still early days in research and development in regards of um, clinical studies, etc. And that is how autism affects the human brain. Now, this is an MRI brain scan. It's not an exact scan of what I'm talking about, just an example image. But does anyone know, have a rough idea of what an MRI brain scan is? OK, so yeah, so what it is is that your brain will be scanned in this machine, and they will detect for electro patterns to see what areas of the brain are active. And what they found in some of these studies is that people with autism um, say, whoops, my apologies. So say they were asked to think of, say, a tennis racket. The person without autism, one area of the brain illuminated. The person with autism, a completely different area of the brain illuminated. Um, and it goes a long way into explaining why people with autism have the challenges that they do, but also why they have strengths that they do. Fundamentally, 
if this is correct, it could mean that people with autism have, in some respects, different brain chemistry. Um, and there have been talks about putting the MRI scan within the um, diagnostic process, but again, we're talking very, very early days within the process. <clears throat> so, the next is about the senses. So we learn about that the brain um, is affected if by somebody with autism. What's not known a lot is that the five senses are affected, be it sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. Now I'm going to give you some examples, some that I experienced, some that friends, family, etc. have experienced. So for sight, everyone knows the idea that Let's say, let's say this was an interview situation. This would be a really intimidating interview, right? I'm here, and you're all interviewing me for this job at Skipton Building Society. Wow, that's a big interview panel. But let's say, let's say for instance, I instead of giving you direct eye contact, I was like this. Immediately, through unconscious bias or whatever have you, I'm immediately not paying attention. But what if I told you some people with autism report that giving eye contact gives the same sensation to them as if you got chlorinated water in your eyes. Now all of a sudden some autistic people not giving eye contact makes a sense. Uh, makes sense. Um, next, people with autism tend to notice a lot of patterns in things. Some things that people don't even associate with a pattern. They go, ooh, this is how this all interlinks together. Um, and also things like certain lighting, some people report that lights are flickering when other people will think, no, they're not, you, what are you on about? Um, maybe bright lights will impact them, things like that. Ultimately, what this comes down to is that the brain of an autistic person has no filters. So what I mean by this is that the neurotypical or normal brain has pre-made pre filters so that people don't get bombarded by information. The autistic brain doesn't work like that. We just get the whole wham. We get all the information all at once, whether we want it or not. So hearing, it may be a case of people will he literally hear the pin drop. It may be the, I'll give an example. So I'm gonna have to kind of single one or two people out in the audience. You don't have to do anything, but I'll just say, so let's just say myself and my good colleague, Stu, we're, we're talking about something about uh, a mortgage product release. But while we're talking, these two people here, we're talking about the absolute belting time they had in Barcelona. And these guys over here were talking about that annoying team meeting that's happening next week. Now, let's put it, so what, what I'm getting at here is that all that noise and information blends in. It doesn't become overly coherent. So all of a sudden, myself and my colleague here Instead of talking about mortgage launch, we're talking about the mortgage la launch, with, which includes the anointing meeting in Barcelona. What the hell's that? So, next is taste, and that is how the autistic person reacts to certain um, uh, tastes of food groups. And this is quite interesting, because a lot of young kids with autism will be labelled at a very young age as fussy eaters. And the reason for that being is that if you consume something that's not good for you, you know, let's say it goes back to our caveman or cavewoman ancestry of if you accidentally ingested a poisonous berry, what does the body do? It tries to bring it back. I won't go into detail, I know it's lunchtime. But if that, if that reaction's triggered from anything basic, I don't know, be it potatoes, ham, spinach, I don't know, whatever it could be, but there's no logical rhyme or reason as to why, you then get a rationale as to why that autistic child is a fussy eater. Uh, touch, um, this is when some people with autism will experience what I can only describe as great discomfort when either being patted on the back by a colleague or a classmate, or maybe they don't like the feeling of a certain material against their skin, um, there's a reason People never see me wearing jeans, for example, because of a feeling of denim against my skin I find very irritating. Um, for me, it's just irritating. Some people, it goes as far as to actually displaying a rash um, because, again, the brain is sending communications to the body that whatever you have in contact on your skin ain't a good thing. 
and then the last one, smell. Um, it can lead to a very heightened sense of smell. So let's say everyone in here is wearing, I don't know, Chanel number no. five or Lynx or whatever it is. They may be able to detect every single individual aroma and become very overpowered by it. Or in other cases, they may not be able to detect a smell at all. For context, I used to be um, a mental health support worker in supported living, and we had a patient in our care who was autistic who couldn't smell gas. You can guess from you know, a health and safety point of view and safeguarding, that was a bit of a problem. Because um, if they can't smell if there's a gas leak, then there you go. So, next is for folk with autism, give them the right environment, give them the right area to develop, they can develop interests. And when I say interests, I mean hobbies, but to folk looking in, so to people seeing the autistic person, they're not just hobbies, they're not just interests, they're fascinations, they become solely dedicated to this particular thing um, which can make them experts in their subject area. Um, you know, I can tell you the cost breakdown of building a Death Star, for example, but unfortunately no one will employ me to do that yet. Um, but I'm also very interested in how business and economics and marketing work, that's why I'm doing a degree. Um, now, as well as the common strengths here that I've just mentioned, there are also some uh, weaknesses and some barriers that autistic people face I want to cover now. So, the first example I want to give is social interaction. So, people with autism find it extremely difficult to socialize uh, in all kinds of situations like group work, for example. Uh, and the reason for that, it, I, the reason for that, I should explain, I heard a brilliant kind of analogy, if you will, is that it's almost as if the autistic person is speaking English in a sec as a second language. Uh, so you've got the person who's speaking to them in it, you know, you're both speaking the same tongue, but to the autistic person, they're having to, they get the audio, you know, what's being spoken, they're having to process and think, what does that mean? What does that facial expression mean? What does that tone of voice mean? Did they mean to be mean to me? Were they not mean to me? Was it banter? All these kinds of things just go swirl around in the head. So the next one, I've already mentioned strange nonverbal behavior. Now, it can be eye contact, but it can also be how one displays and presents himself. So if I'm in an important me you know, meeting and we're you know, doing some important project, you know, right, right, come on, let's get this done and you're pitching to, say, a client or another member of, of SBS's teams, and I'm just sat there like this, you're going to think, what, what's he doing? Why, why isn't he sat upright, assentive, giving eye contact, and giving all those non-verbal cues that mean that you're being assertive? Or, well, not assertive, at attentive? Paying attention. Um, and <coughs> the nature of that, again, is because... Um, what I would say for, for that is that the autistic person may be presenting that, but it doesn't mean they're not paying attention. So it may be that they're a bit overloaded by what's going on around them and they're just, pro just focusing on processing other things. So all of the actions, i.e. posture, eye contact, go out the window. Next, misunderstanding of common phrases. So things like sarcasm, banter, uh, common phrases like it's raining cats and dogs. Um, they can be very tricky because it's hard to detect what tone of voice means, what does a facial expression mean, as I'd already explained. So um, during my university education, a teacher said, oh, well, if you think it's such a great idea, why didn't you write a 1,000 page, uh, page report? And I begrudging said, OK, I'll give it a go. But you know, I said to another teacher, I said, I think this is a bit much of a high end. I didn't really realize that they weren't being serious, um, <laughs> which uh, is good because that would have led to many sleepless nights. Um, as I've mentioned, misunderstanding sarcasm. Um, and this one's really important. Autistic people tend to have a very black and white view of the world. It's right or it's wrong. It's a one or it's a zero. Um, you know, if somebody speaks to you and there's that kind of banter edge, you know, which 
isn't negative, it's just a bit of pokey funny, but immediately, that person's been rude to me, why would you do something like that? You're a bad person. Immediately like that, there's no grey area, which sucks because we're in a world full of a million shades of grey. So, in that instance, it may be that the autistic person needs maybe a bit more time to process what's going on. So, next is time management and routine. Um, I only I was a bit uh, preemptuous of this as we were waiting to start. I was constantly every minute, oh, are we on time? Are we on time? Autistic folk tend to be very pedantic and reliant on time, time management, um, and won't cope well with change. So if there's a sudden change in the day, bang, all of a sudden things aren't so good. And it can just be a bit of mm, feet stomping, a bit annoyed, but it can be worse than that. Um, but we'll go into more of that later on. <coughs> Excuse me. So next, there are two reactions that I've mentioned that the brain picks up all of this information, so all of this sensory stuff, all of this confusing social dogmatic information and all of this stuff about timings and so on which just drive you a bit mad. So there are two reactions which are perfectly normal to an autistic person, I must make that very clear, but are very negative. Now I want to give an example. Who? Well, I, I'm not going to say who here has done this, but basically, if you take a bottle of Fizzy Pop, whatever brand, Fanta, Cola, Pepsi, whatever you want, just take it, don't open it and shake it, what happens? It fizzes up. Then you keep shaking it, then what happens? The pressure builds. And then what happens when the pressure builds its tipping point? The lid goes, there's a huge mess everywhere, and then you have to tidy it up. But in essence is what the first reaction is called, and that is a meltdown. And I use the picture of the Hulk because it's quite symbolic of it, but I'll explain why. So all this pressure's built up. You're not sure if your classmate or your colleague or your family friend has, you know, have they just slighted you, or was it just one of these jokes you just don't get? And, ah, the lights are just blinding me, and nobody seems to understand that the lights are faulty, and all this other stuff just builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up until you hit a precipice. And that is that the brain receives way too much information to handle at once. So what happens? The person with autism goes into what's called a meltdown, which is a, what I would call an external reactor. So you're projecting that reaction onto the people and objects around you. It can come across as, um, I don't know, maybe kicking a piece of furniture, verbal barrage, or in some case, physical assault. It's no way um, acceptable behaviour, but it's part and parcel of the condition. Um, I want to make that clear, it's not, this isn't me saying, oh, it's perfectly acceptable, it isn't. And what happens with a lot of folk with autism is that they'll have this meltdown, but leading up to that, they'll essentially experience a moment of almost like a blackout. So they'll get to a point of past no return, blank, have they gone? Then a few seconds later, they come to, I don't know, a desk's maybe knocked over, and their leg hurts because they've kicked it, but they just for that few, few minutes of just raw emotion, just completely gone out the window. They're powerless, they're guilty, and they feel like, just, they feel awful. I'm trying to keep this friendly. Um, and one thing to be extremely clear on is that it's not acceptable behavior. It is part and parcel of a condition but it's not to be confused with other behaviour. This is more so in kids, but you've, I'm sure we've all seen in a supermarket the kids near the toy aisle and they're kicking and screaming because mum or dad won't buy them the latest Transformers Megazord toy or whatever kids are into these days. Um, this isn't to be confused with that. That's, that their tantrum reaction is, I'm not getting my way, give me what I want. A uh, meltdown reaction is essentially the brain saying, you've got to fight or flight. You've got to fight whatever it is that's giving you stress, or distress, rather. The polar opposite of that is what's called a shutdown. So I explained a meltdown is 
external to the surrounding environment, a shutdown is internal to that individual. And this is where a person with autism, again, receives far too much information, and the, instead of the, the brain saying, fight it, it's saying, run away. So it may be the autistic person just does that, just walk, goes away, runs away, walks off. It may be that they, and I use the term literally, they shut down from the outside world. So you might see them, they're just blank, you talk to them, they don't respond, they're despondent to everything and everyone around them. They're essentially shutting down into a, well, in a distressed state, but in a way to try and preserve their own mental well-being. <clears throat> and they can be extremely hard to detect. So remember I mentioned earlier that everyone with autism spectrum disorders are affected differently. So let's say somebody on a good day, maybe you work with, maybe it's a friend of a family, what have you. Maybe on a good day they don't really talk. What if on a good day they don't really give you eye contact anyway? What if on a good day they barely do any social acknowledgement? So how would you detect that? It's very difficult. And a resulting of these um, shutdowns can lead to other um, mental health issues such as clinical depression, uh, and other issues, but I won't go too much into detail, but been there, done that. So, next, do vaccines cause autism? Now, I put in a section I call myth busting into this PowerPoint because I've been doing these speeches, talks, info sessions now for on and off 10 years, and I've had lots of interesting Q&As over the years, and I've just inserted a few which I thought were genuinely quite good. Um, just to preach to other folk. So in the 90s, um, when I was born, there was a huge hoo-ha about the MMR vaccine causing autism. Um, and the, what it, what's known as the anti-vax movement has recently been gaining prevalence again. Um, just no, make it known right here, right now, that any indication that autism is caused by vaccines is a load of Coswallop. Um, the scientist who did said research back in the 90s was struck off uh, the various medical boards, etc. Um, currently living in America, living it up with people affiliated to um, this gentleman's um, political campaign, but <laughs> we won't go there. Luckily, though, not many people think that autism does in fact be caused by vaccines except for again that chap but luckily he's not in any form of political p oh wait apart from him um so that's myth one myth two can i catch it now you'll be all pleased to know that if you leave here and i have happened to cough or sneeze or generally you know shake your hand or whatever you will not leave here being socially awkward so be at peace the understanding of how autism is caused is that the belief so far is that it's genetic, so that it's passed down through families, um, and there's no, known, there's no known causality or cure, but that's the current prevalent theory. Um, if you looked at my dad, you'd go, yeah, he's certainly interesting. Um, but of course, that was what it was back then. He was interesting. He was into his mechanics. He wasn't autistic. Um, is that from the, the male side, female side? Or I'll, I'll get to it in a moment, sir. So the next one. The idea that we're all these big, em well, not big, but these emotionless robots, these like Cybermen, Android, blank-faced, you know, pale slate, emotionless robots, the notion of that, I want to quash right now and say, again, it's a load of baloney. What I would say, and the reason I put the question marks up, is that sometimes we're bombarded with so much information, we're not sure how we should be feeling. Should I be happy because this work report got submitted? Should I be upset because this friend spoke to me in a way? Were they banterous? Were they mean? Um, should I be you know, confused? Should I be happy? We just aren't quite sure how we should be feeling because we're feeling all these things at once and we're like, ah, I don't know what I'm really doing. Um, and yeah, just wanted to put it on nail on the head. We do actually feel emotion, so 
Hurrah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next, how many people have autism? So most stats today point to roughly one in 100. Some stats say it's as many as one in 60 people. When I was diagnosed in the 90s, it was about one in 1,000. Uh, and when autism first started being diagnosed, I think it was in the 60s or 70s, uh, in places like the US, it was something like one in 10,000. Now, the reason for this increased prevalence is because the diagnostic techniques have become a lot more efficient. Um, now, to your point, sir, every three in four person, every three in four people with autism is male, and every one in four is female. Now, there are two uh, theories of rationale behind this. Theory one is that it's because of a difference between the male and female brain that the, the male brain is more prevalent to developing autism. I'm personally of backing a theory two, and theory two suggests that because the vast majority of research done on autism is done on men and boys and not on women and girls. So I'm personally of theory two, um, but the vast majority of research is done on men and boys, so therefore you can't really pick it up in women and girls because you barely researched it. That's changing, but just to give some context. So it's all very wonderful, me talking about autism and how wonderfully weird I am, but how the heck is this relevant to SBS? So the first one is about financial vulnerability, be it in our customers and maybe even our colleagues. So there is, um, <clears throat> there is a form of uh, hate crime called dis disability hate crime. Um, a lot of people with autism, 32% roughly, have been vi victim of a disability hate crime because of their autism. Um, and mate crime has been rising in prevalence as a disability hate crime. Now, mate crime is interesting in, uh, in that I think it could be, again, quite relevant to our customer base. So how does mate crime work? So I'll try and run you through it. So I'm the autistic person. I'm not overly, well, say, I'm stereotyping here, but I'm allowed to. With, um, let's say, I'm the autistic customer, and I've just made a friend at work. Oh, you know, and I, I say, oh, um, it, it, you know, because I don't have much social filter and this person showing interest. Oh, my, my nan, uh, unfortunately, just passed away. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Did, did she leave you an inheritance? Uh, y yes, she did. Oh, that's interesting. Do you, want, do you want to go for a pint after work? Yeah, of course I would. That'd be great. When we get to the pub, oh, he says, oh, mate, can, can you lend us a fiver? Uh, my, my, my card stopped working. Yeah, of course, mate, no problem. A week later, oh, mate, my, my, they still haven't sent me my new card. Could you lend us a tenner for the canteen? Y yeah, of course, of course. And it's just ever so slowly, before you know it, that autistic person could be signing credit agreements in, f f in their name for this person, be it payday loans, car lease, whatever it may be, because that individual or that so-and-so is using the fact that that autistic person isn't as well socially adjusted or um, as socially aware of these kinds of behaviours to understand that this person isn't their friend, that they're actually taking advantage of them. Next is about more about colleague interaction. So again, you're in this big meeting, you're talking to the head honchos of, say, your team, and you're pitching this great idea, you've spent months on it, and the colleague who you've picked to go into the office has decided to just lounge around, not show eye contact, they're just generally looking like they're not giving a monkeys. Now, if they're autistic, is it because they're not giving a monkeys or because of some nature of their disability? It may also be that they respond maybe rather abruptly or bruntly to verbal or written communication. So you may get an email back from them that just says something like, well, that comes across as maybe a bit brash or rude, not intentionally, but may just come across that way. Um, next, what can, um, again, this is, again, can be for colleagues, but more for customers. Can the customer or the colleague convey what it is they're actually wanting to say? So if they're struggling to communicate, um, 
are we as an organisation or you know as colleagues or what have you, are we able to step back and think, right, what is this person actually trying to convey here? Because there may be miscommunication, maybe they've read a piece of communication, be it a letter or an email, misread it, misunderstood the information, and they may come into branch, you know, saying, where's all my money gone? When all you've do all the communication says, let's say, a fixed rate bond has matured and has been auto-rolled over to an easy access. But they may read that as, you've taken my money and given it to somebody else in an easy access. I'm trying to think of something off the fly, but hopefully you get where I'm coming from. Um, and next, routine and detail. So, you know, somebody might be, have been looking forward to coming to this session today, and then the worst comes to worst, I had no break my foot and sneeze and had no catch the flu or something, and we have to cancel. Does that person then start to have a negative impact on others or to themselves within that working environment because of that change? Um, I appreciate this is quite complicated and a lot to take in, but um, hopefully I'm getting there. So, how can we relate to autism? On a more personal level, not just in the case of how it relates to how we work here at Skipton Building Society. So, I want to first mention some famous figures who either have autism or are suspected to have had autism, or what have you. First, we have Mr. Gates, who was formerly richest man in the world, formerly head of Microsoft, and now head of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Albert Einstein, uh, quite a famous uh, scientist. Um, Tim Burton, he's the chap who made Batman cool again, enough said. Um, and I can never pronounce his name, uh, Satosh Tajari. Does anybody know why he's famous? He is the mind behind a little thing called Pokemon. Several billions later, I think he did all right. Um, next, more famous figures. We have Mark Zuckerberg, head of Facebook, although his favor of fame is changing ever so slightly. Um, Gary Newman, love his music. Uh, and Susan Boyle, who was on, was it X Factor or Britain's Got Talent? Britain's Got Talent, that was it. Um, Next, uh, there are some films and TV shows that you guys can watch or see, or you maybe have seen, that you may be able to relate and see maybe some characters in them which have autism or uh, it's suggested. The first, uh, Doc Martin, um, it's heavily implied in one or two episodes that he's autistic, and then the rest of the time they don't mention it, but once you get that idea in your head, it's quite obvious the way his, uh, Bedside, bedside, um, bedside manner, you know, the way he speaks to patients, the way he speaks to other people, and the way he conducts himself. Next, um, a series called The Bridge. I can't remember if it's Scandinavian or uh, Danish, but English subtitled. Very good crime series um, where two investigators have to find various uh, murderers, etc. Fairly self explanatory. But the interesting thing about it is that the lead female. Is suggest you know it's implied that she's autistic, but the lead male is very empathetic, emotional, and what have you. Whereas it's normally the other way around. It's the male lead who's normally, well, maybe not cold, but very just do the case, do the case. And it's usually the female lead who's quite empathetic and what have you, with be it the victims or colleagues. Um, next, the Social Network, um, the movie about how Facebook came to be. Uh, next, the Fifth Estate. This is actually quite relevant now, uh, the story of how Julian Assange started WikiLeaks. Um, and again, it's mentioned in the film that he might be on the spectrum. Uh, the A Word, this is a series from the BBC where um, it's a free, you know, three generations of family, so the kid, the parent, the grandparent, the youngest kid gets diagnosed autistic, and it's how the family react to that diagnosis and it's really interesting because the parents are very supportive and the grandparents are very almost hostile to the diagnosis. Uh, and House, which is a brilliant medical drama in, set in the US but has Hugh Laurie as the main actor, really recommend it. Um, if anyone here likes Sherlock, think of it as like the medical version of Sherlock. Next, books. Anyone here a bookworm? So first one, I can never pronounce the author's name, Jodie Pickles, thank you. Uh, house rules. 
interesting book. It's a fiction where it's a single mum and two sons. One of the sons is autistic, and the autistic son is arrested under suspicion of committing murder. Whilst he's in custody and in the trial, he's showing odd tendencies. He's not giving the interviewing cop eye contact. He's slouching in his chair. He's, he's looking very uncomfortable and very unsure of things. Now, is it because he's guilty or is it because he's autistic? I won't go any further. It's a very good read. I read the whole thing, 400 something pages in like a week. It's wow. Um, next, Lives of Autism, a book by a chap called Dr. Steve Mee from the University of Cumbria. Each chapter in the book is written by a different person of autism. Disclosure, I added two um, about uh, a time I was an apprentice with a local authority and the other time when I worked with or battled the uh, local job centre lot. Um, next, All Cats of Asperger Syndrome. This book is awesome. So this book by Kathy Hoopman, what it does is it takes all the big scary words and all the big scary jargon it just chucks out the window. It's just a picture book filled with pictures of cats I and mean, it'll have a little line under each, underneath each picture relating it to an autistic trait. It's amazing. It takes all the stigma and all the scary stuff and relates it to something we can all essentially relate to. Either we've owned a cat or we know someone who owns a cat, that kind of thing. I will disclaim though, exclaim, no, I will mention but there is also another book by the same author called All Dogs of ADHD. Just when, you, when you think of that in your mind, you're like, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, next, same author, Inside Asperger's Looking Out. Same premise, but not just cats, it relates to other animals as well. Um, so I want to do a bit of a QA now, but it's slightly different to what you may expect. So what I want to do is you guys talk amongst yourself for a minute or two, then I'm going to call end to that and then we'll do an open QA. Now when I say open QA, any question goes. The worst I can do is say, I don't know. Um, so and there's no such thing as a daft question um, and what have you. So don't feel like, oh, I can't really say that, that sounds bad, I won't care. Just say it as it is um, and just be as honest as you like or as critical or whatever it is as you like in these questions. So um, yeah, chat amongst yourself for a minute or two. So, okay, so who wants to be the first? Yes. Correct. Um, I'll give two parts of that answer. So the first one would be if somebody comes to work for any organisation, personally I always encourage transparency and saying, hi, I'm Richard, I'm autistic or whatever be the condition, but we can't be in an environment where we force that because it's people's business. You know, I'm very open, I'm autistic. Other folk will say, oh, well, that's my business, no one else's. Um, in regards to how I manage things, uh, I've got an absolutely brilliant team and manager around me um, who kind of get how wonderfully quirky I am as an individual. Um, and it's a very open, I've found that SBS in the time I've been here is a very open environment in which I can say, hang on a minute, I need a few just to maybe process this information a bit more or to say, you know, if there is a mistake, to you know, feel comfortable to hold your hands up and say, right, I've, I've made, I've made a boo boo, <laughs> and um, you know, not been torn limb from limb metaphorically, um, you know, and just to say, right, okay, well, this is what happened. How can we make this not happen in the future? And by something going, I mean, in work wise, not behaviourally wise, Oops. Um, and um, so. Do you mean, sorry, so in regards of your question, so do you also mean how others could support others with autism, say, or? Sure. Yeah. 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 
yeah. Well, I, as I've mentioned, I used to work as a mental health support worker, because so I've been on the receiving end of, you know, be it meltdowns and what have you. So, you know, I, I know both ends of the scale, so to speak. Um, yeah, again, it depends, and it sounds a bit like a cop out of an answer, but it depends on the individual. So, you'll have some folk with autism who really, really, really struggle and they'll, you know, have a shutdown or a meltdown very frequently. I'm in the fortunate position where I maybe have a shutdown or a meltdown maybe once a year. Um, and again, I, I reiterate that's again a kind of a natural kind of reaction, but it's a case of I've developed some strategies in which to kind of quell them off, etc. Um, yeah, so I, I would say in relation to what you're saying about future, potentially future employees, etc., it's a case of keep them at communication open um, and just so it's always very awkward to ask about additional uh, requirements, uh, reasonable adjustments, things like that. Uh, it can be a very awkward uh, conversation, but it's a conversation that should be had. Um, so yeah, I'm not 100% sure how I could answer that because again, it depends on the individual, but I think encouraging the open you know, discussion about it and the maybe the disclosure of said disability would be the best way to go so at least then other members of you know, be it HR or whatever at least ha maybe have an understanding so that if something did happen there's a rationale behind it if that makes sense yeah yeah so I mean like in uni if something was going a bit mad I'd go and you know take a brisk walk for a few minutes or you know if it was later on I'd try and go to the gym or something or, or just something or if it was the polar opposite be a shutdown I'd just I don't know go to the dorm I was living in and just close my way myself away from people which some folk would think that's the opposite of what you should be doing because of a lot of the stigma around mental health etc but just for me personally it helps a lot just to be able to shut off everything else and everyone else and just go right Calm yourself. <laughs> so, uh, but if you want to bring it up, uh, discuss it further, more in detail, just because I can't be more specific here, so to speak, but feel free to catch up with me afterwards. Hope that's answered okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what were you? Okay. Sure. Well, yeah. Get, stick around after. I'll give you my contact details. In answer to your other point, um, predominantly it's been schools, businesses, um, NHS um, that I've presented to. Because, and I and I like to share these stories because. It's because of what I call professionals that I got into this. I was sick and tired of people reading a textbook and telling me how I'm me. So I want to give you two uh, little examples. Uh, and one was uh, with um, a, a, a firm. You may have read this on the team, what is it, Friday interview, where I was working as a mental health support worker and a colleague and I were just sat in the staff room and one of them just said, oh, this wage is a bit rat naff and at the time I thought well it's just above minimum wage you know it's not the best but I thought well if you know a job's a job and this is the highest wage I've ever had and they said oh I'm on I don't know eight pounds an hour and I said wait a minute what I'm on only on 780 anyway so I made a note of it I didn't kick off I just made a note of it and went to see my manager for you know your regular performance reviews and they said um, well, they said, you're on what's called a trial period because you're autistic. And because you're on a trial period, it means we can pay you the lower rate, which, of course, I was a bit upset about. Um, and, you know, because I was doing the exact same job as these other colleagues. And I should stress that in that line of work, you know, you could have a patient pull a weapon on you, like a knife or something, or have to perform CPR. You know, it wasn't a, by any means a walk in the park. Um, so then I went to my manager's manager and they went higher up and it caused a bit of a rift. Some people in the organization were 
barefaced saying, I don't see what the problem is, and other people were saying, how can you not see there's a problem? And then I wrote to the CEO of the company saying, you've got five days, or I go to the media, I want my back pay. Within three days, the money was in my account, and two days after that, I handed my notice, just out of a principle that I feel that, like in this organization, I'm worth a damn. Um, and the other one, so this takes place, this one takes place when I was about 15, 16 years old, and um, the school noticed myself and a few other young lads with autism were really struggling to fit in socially. So they organized a specialist social worker to come in and help us. And we thought, oh, okay, yeah, maybe this will help. And we said, what, what, you know, they asked, what do we want to learn more about? And you know, being 15, 16 year old lads, our three priorities were, how do we get in with the lads and what is this thing called banter? What is the point in this thing called football? And how do we talk to the women? That was our three <laughs> ultimate aims. It wasn't we need to talk to our tutors more to get our GCSEs, because who cares about that? Um, but those were the three points. So just imagine you guys are now all us, the autistic students just sat there. And I'm going to enact as best as I can, I fail drama, but I will do my best, mm -hmm. to enact what happened next. So this person comes in and she goes, Hello, everyone. So there's a table here, I should stress. Did you see what I just did? Did you see it? I just put on the table the invisible toolbox. And we will use it to fix our emotions. We're all there like, what in the hell? <laughs> so anyway, she goes through this invisible toolbox malarkey and then me being me and not exactly being, I should explain that, and this has happened in this role, sometimes I will word something in a way that's not overly coy or courteous, you know, there's a way, so think of it like this and it may be more appropriate to the ladies in the audience, so actually it is only really appropriate to the ladies in the audience, but what have you. So the example is, you and your girlfriend are going out on a night out and she comes out with this dress and she's like, oh, how do I look? And you're thinking, mm, maybe you should try something else. I'd be, I'd be that girlfriend that says, it looks terrible. Change it now. <laughs> you look disgraceful. You know, rather than, maybe you should try a different colour, Sandra. You know, there's two ways of going about it. So I was more of a more abrupt version. So anyway, so we learned about the invisible toolbox. And at the end, I said, you realise I'm going to look like a real spanner and not an invisible one if I use this in the real world, to which I was asked to go back and go away, never come back, um, which was very supportive, etc. Um, a week later, nobody else turned up and the sub learning support department decreed that it wasn't as successful as hoped. Um, but yeah, but those are two kind of funny stories from the past that got me into what I'm doing. So yeah, but please, n no invisible toolboxes. I still have flashbacks. Um, I think I put an invisible hammer through a whole metaphor, but yeah. Um, <laughs> anybody else have any questions? As I said, there's no such thing as a daft one or whatever. Uh, yes? So, yeah, so a lot of my friends kind of know how I tick. So, and we will have banter, like we'll, um, I don't know, be going for a night out and I'm like, mate, you said we'd be there by nine and you'd be like, huh, stop being so autistic about it, doesn't matter if we're late. And I'm like, lol. Um, um, and um, whereas a few years ago, I'd be like, how dare you insult the fact that I'm autistic? Um, but, you know, things have changed. But they also get that sometimes I'll be like, wait, what do you mean? And they'll actually stop and rephrase. In regards of things younger, it was very difficult because a lot of kids in school would get the idea that I would take things very literally. So of course they'd say things like, hey, if you, uh, the teacher said you should do this, I'm like, oh, okay, and then put something in the bin that I shouldn't have. Oh, but so the teacher, but so-and-so said the teacher said to do it, um, and things like that. And um, I was also brought up, my dad, I don't know what, how you'd describe how he was, but he was a very kind of old fashioned bloke in respect of, if somebody gives you a thump, you give them a thump back. Um, so it meant I got into a few fights. But the, the funny thing is, and I mentioned this years ago to my school, and they kind of went open mouthed like I never even realised. 
punishment systems in school. In my school, it was detention, isolation, suspension, and expulsion. I never got as far as suspension or expulsion because I was a good boy. But, so detention. You go from a massive hall with nearly a thousand students all sitting, chewing with all the aromas and smells and all the noise and all the crap. In detention, you're in a little quiet room by yourself. The food is brought to you. There's nobody there. What a punishment. <laughs> Isolation. Same principle, but for, all the, for the whole day. The schoolwork is brought to you. You don't have to listen to Callum talk about how many birds he got with last night. You don't have to listen to, you don't have to, listen to the fact that um, Shin, I don't know, um, Sandra got a new car from her dad because reasons or whatever. You don't have to listen to all that stuff. You can just quietly get on with your work all by yourself. What a punishment. <laughs> so um, I, I'm not going to say that I was a badly behaved student on purpose, but the punishments for defending oneself weren't very deterative. Um, that's not even a word, but there you go. Um, yeah, but it, it was very difficult, and I will put that out there, you know, because, again, it was that kind of manipulation. I did. Again, sim similar to what happens with mate crime, you know, them saying, oh, Rich, it, it, we'd be your friend if you did this, and then I'd go and do it, and they'd say, ha, ha you're an idiot, um, and things like that. Um, and then as things, you know, went on through life, you know, similar things happened in prior workplaces, etc. You know, people would say, oh, well, what, you know, why don't you just do this and blah, 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 and what have you. But hopefully that answers your question a bit. It was just a case of a lot of trial and error and then doing a lot of growing up in my early 20s and then learning that those people actually weren't my friends. They were actually um, not nice people. <laughs> so there you go. Anyone else? From the confidence factor then, you appear very confident. Again, have you had the opportunity to work on that, uh, get some coaching? Or so, for me, doing these kind of talks uh, and things of that, I just studied, uh, you know, I read a lot of books on body language and things like that, and I also watched a lot of public speakers, so the likes of the late Steve Jobs, who founded uh, Apple, he could, he could sell anything. Uh, you know, if you ever wanted to know how to do a presentation, look up a Steve Jobs uh, presentation. Um, I also watched um, presentations from politicians of all colours, you know, uh, Conservative, Labour, Lib Dem, whoever, just to see how they would speak, use their hands, enact, use their tone of voice, um, because all of this to me is, again, unnatural. Uh, I've had to study this, I've had to learn this, I've had to come about this in a completely different way as other folk would. You know, this to me is a second language, all this. Um, so that was that for me. <laughs> um, anyone else? Um, well, they treat me as an equal. Uh, I've, you know, had great opportunities thus far. Um, and when I do have an issue, as I say, my, the, the team I work with in digital are absolutely bob on. Um, and, you know, can't fault them. You know, as I say, in prior organisations, it was very snap, snap, snap. You know, one, I don't know, spelling error and you limbs had metaphorically ripped off, for example. You know, there wasn't that patience, there wasn't that time, and there wasn't that time to nourish and figure out what actually works really well. Um, whereas here, it's just, wow, you know. Um, believe me, once I graduate, I'll be back on the Skipton Careers website. But, um, well, that is if, if, you know, you guys love me back. You might go, oh my God, <laughs> it's that Richard bloke. Oh my God, right, just, just, no. <laughs> yeah, I turned in early <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the vote of support. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully that answers your question. Anyone else, real quick, because we've got a whole zero minutes left. <laughs> well, yeah, if anyone wants to chat to me afterwards, feel free to, because uh, I'll be here for like two minutes. Um, if you want to network with me, my website has links to like LinkedIn, um, Instagram, and all the other cool social media that the hip cool kids are with these days um, and what have you. So yeah, thank you for your time guys. <laughs>